The ASUS TUF Dash F15 is a thinner and lighter gaming laptop, but just how well can a quad-core CPU hold up in 2021? And does it bottleneck the RTX 3070 graphics? Let's find out in this review. My model has Intel's 11th gen quad-core 11370H processor, NVIDIA RTX 3070 graphics, 16 gigs of memory, and a 1080p 240Hz screen. But there are also other configurations available. You can check out other configurations of this machine, as well as updated prices with the links down in the description. Mine has has a clean black finish with metal lid and plastic interior, but there's also an all white model too. The laptop alone weighs about 2 kilos or 4.5 pounds. Then we're looking at 2.7 kilos or 6 pounds with a 200 watt power brick and cables. It's on the smaller side for a 15 inch laptop, coming in under 2 centimeters thick, something I don't think we've seen before from the Tough series. The 15.6 inch 1080p screen has all right color gamut and contrast ratio. There's no muck switch, so no G Sync, but it does have adaptive sync. Brightness is able to get above. 300 nits at maximum, but this is just for the 240Hz panel. Expect different results with other options. The ASUS Armory Crate software, the control panel for the laptop, gives us the option to enable or disable panel overdrive, which affects screen response time. With overdrive off, we're looking at a 7.7 millisecond average gray to gray response time. Then with it on, this lowers to around 5.8 milliseconds, so not quite under the 4.16 milliseconds needed for transitions to occur within the refresh window. It's not too bad when compared against others, not the worst result for a 240Hz panel, but clearly not the best either. Backlight bleed wasn't bad, a little imperfection on the top, but not something I noticed during regular use. But this will vary between panels and laptops. Unfortunately, there's no camera here, like many others from ASUS. It does still have microphones though, and this is what they sound like. The chiclet keyboard has a single zone of RGB backlighting. It's got three levels of key brightness, and all keys and secondary functions are illuminated. Plus the WASD keys are clearly marked in case you had any doubts about this being a gaming laptop. Typing felt a little clicky with 1.7 millimeters of key travel. I had no problems using it other than my personal annoyance with smaller arrow keys. The power button is separate to the keyboard, so no need to worry about an accidental press. There are also additional buttons on the left for changing volume, muting the mic, and opening the Armory Crate software. There also appears to be some air vents back there too. The precision touchpad clicks down anywhere and works fine. It's making use of the available space and isn't too small, nothing to complain about. On the left from the back there's an air exhaust vent, the power input, gigabit ethernet port facing the preferred way so you don't have to pick up the machine to remove the cable, HDMI 2.0b output, USB 3.2 Gen 1 Type-A port, a Type-C Thunderbolt 4 port which can be used to charge the laptop, and a 3.5mm audio combo jack. The right has two more USB 3.2 Gen 1 Type-A ports for three in total, an air exhaust vent on this side too, and a Kensington lock right up the back. Now although that Type-C port does offer DisplayPort 1.4 support, it connects directly to the Intel integrated graphics. So if you've got a VR setup that requires DisplayPort that connects to the Nvidia GPU, then you're out of luck here. However the HDMI port does connect directly to the Nvidia GPU, and I'll show you later how this offers a speed boost in games. The back just has two air exhaust fans towards the corners, and you can see the status LEDs on the back with the lid closed too. The front has a subtle indentation so you can get your finger in to open the lid easily. There's a little flex to the lid, but it is metal and feels fairly sturdy. The plastic interior has some flex if you go out of your way to push down, but it felt fine otherwise during regular use. Fingerprints share up pretty easily, but the smooth finish is easy to clean with a microfiber cloth. The bottom panel is plastic too, with air ventilation holes directly above the intake fans, otherwise quite clean. And as you can see here, those vents aren't covered up, air can get through. Getting inside requires removing 15 Phillips head screws, and there are three different sizes, so keep track of them. And the one down the front right doesn't come out and instead helps you open the laptop, which I found easy to do with the tools linked in the description. Inside we've got the battery down the front, Wi-Fi 6 card above on the left, two PCIe Gen 3 M.2 storage slots to the right of that, and a single memory slot. Like a lot of other laptops from ASUS, you can either get 8 or 16 gigs soldered to the motherboard, with just one slot for upgradability. As long as there's a stick installed, it will run in dual channel. But I'll note the Samsung stick that came in my unit is the slower type found in the Lenovo Legion 5 Pro and the SUS Strix G15 Advantage. The speakers are underneath on the front towards the left and right sides. I thought they sounded average. There's a little bass and they're clear enough at higher volumes, and the latency mod results weren't too bad. The F15 has a 4-cell 76Wh battery, and it was lasting a similar amount to two other ASUS laptops 
with the same sized battery one spot above and below it, so about as expected. 8 hours is an above average result in this test. The panel power saver option is enabled in the Armory Crate software by default. With this enabled, when you unplug the laptop from wall power, the screen will flash black while it automatically drops down to a 60Hz refresh rate and disables panel overdrive to save battery. Then it will automatically change back when you plug back in, an excellent feature that I wish all brands would implement. There's also the option to set iGPU mode to on, which basically disables the Nvidia discrete graphics to help boost battery life. You don't have to do this, as Optimus will generally take care of you, but this way some random applications can't attempt to call the RTX 3070, as it's simply not available. Let's check out thermals next. The Armory Crate software lets us change between different performance profiles, which from lowest to highest are silent, performance, and turbo. There's no manual mode for customizing fan speed and power limits like the higher end ROG models, though turbo mode does apply the following overclock to the GPU. The idle results down the bottom were a little warm given it's doing nothing. I've run stress tests with both the CPU and GPU loaded up to represent a worst case, as well as playing an actual game. No thermal throttling was happening at all, and even in the worst case we're in the low 80s here. So great results from a temperature perspective. However, if this comes at the expense of lower power limits then we may be looking at lower performance compared to others. If not, then it could just be that a 10 nanometer quad core doesn't create a whole lot of heat. These are the clock speeds from this same test. The quad core i7-11370H has a 4.3 GHz all core turbo boost speed, and this was being hit in this particular game in turbo mode, and we're a little behind this maximum in the combined CPU plus GPU stress test. When looking at the power levels, we can see that the CPU is capped to 35 watts, which is why these quad core chips are referred to as H35. This is the Intel spec, so it's running as it should. Meanwhile, the RTX 3070 is running at 80 watts, which is the lowest in the range for the 3070. In a GPU only stress test, Dynamic Boost could boost the GPU up to 85 watts when the CPU is idle. Here's how an actual game performs with these different modes in use. There's no major change between performance and turbo mode. While we can boost average FPS 7% simply by connecting an external monitor to the HDMI port, as this bypasses Optimus. Here's how the different modes perform in Cinebench R23. So again, not that big of a difference between performance and turbo modes, especially in single core performance, at least compared to silent mode, which is lower comparatively. But as you'll hear soon, it's quite a two as per the name. Here's how the F15 stacks up compared to others in CPU performance. Now it is a lower result as it's a quad core processor, but at the same time, it's the best multi-core score I've got from any quad core so far, and it's only slightly behind the six core Ryzen options from last generation, while also offering one of the highest single core scores I've seen. The single core performance hardly changes when running on battery power. However, multi-core drops back a bit. We've now got two other quad core laptops that are outperforming it while running on battery, but hey, it's still beating the eight core MSI GE76 just below it. The keyboard sits in the low 40s when idle, higher than the regular 30 of most others. Not hot, just warm. It gets to the higher 40s towards the back of the keyboard with the stress tests going. Performance mode was similar, warmer than most others in the center, but the wrist rest and sides are cool. It's similar in turbo. Unfortunately, the cool spot is just off to the side of WASD, but WASD isn't uncomfortable. Based on the internal temps, I was expecting a cooler exterior. Let's have a listen to the fans. The fan was audible when idling, but it kind of kept turning on and off, which may be annoying. It wasn't too loud in silent mode, even when under load. Performance mode was louder, then turbo mode was louder still. And that's as loud as it can get, as there's no user fan control. Now let's find out how well this configuration of ASUS Tough F15 compares against others in games. But use these results as a rough guide only, as they were tested at different times with different drivers. I've tested Battlefield 5 in campaign mode at ultra settings, and the F15 is highlighted in red. MSI's GL65 with RTX 2060 is one spot above it in terms of average FPS, but the 1% low from its last generation 6 core with higher power limit is much better. In fact, the 1% low from the F15 is on the lower side out of this selection of laptops, presumably as a result of the quad core processor. Other RTX 3060 laptops, such as MSI's GS76 or even ASUS's own smaller G14, are coming out ahead of the F15, and those are 8 core Intel and AMD options, respectively. So, yeah, it's looking like the quad core chip could be holding 
holding it back. Shadow of the Tomb Raider was tested with the game's benchmark tool with the highest setting preset, and the F-15 was again hitting the same average FPS as the RTX 2060 in the MSI GL65. Now that laptop does have a higher power limit, but it can't disable Optimus either. Seeing a 3070 struggle to beat a 2060 doesn't seem right. Again, it's likely owing to the quad-core processor in the F-15 along with its lower power limit. Far Cry 5 was also tested with the game's benchmark tool at max settings, and this is more of a CPU-heavy game compared to the other two. It's also a game that tends to favour Intel processors, but even with that advantage, the F-15 is down quite a bit compared to all other laptops, only beating the 5500M and 1650 laptops with last-gen 6-core AMD processors. Here are the results from 3 d Mark for those that find them useful. Now for some creator tests. Adobe Premiere was tested with the Puget Systems benchmark. Unlike the gaming results, the F-15 was offering one of the better results, so perhaps the quad-core is less of an issue in some of these creator tasks. Adobe Photoshop generally depends more on processor performance, and the quad-core isn't doing too bad here either. Granted, I think this test benefits from single-threaded performance, and as we saw earlier in Cinebench, it does at least have that on its side. DaVinci Resolve is more GPU-heavy, and the 3070 isn't doing too badly here, but I've got a lot of lower-spec laptops on the graph. It's still coming in below the 3060 in the GS76 just above it with similar wattage, as well as other 3070s. The F-15 is only a little ahead of the last-gen 1660 Ti models here. I've also tested SpecView Perf, which tests out various professional 3D workloads. The 1TB NVMe M.2 SSD in my unit was doing well for both reads and writes. Although Intel H35 should in theory support PCIe Gen 4 storage, both M.2 slots are listed as Gen 3 on the motherboard, so I'm guessing it's only Gen 3. The BIOS is pretty much the same as all of the others from Asus, just the usual basic options that you'd expect to see. I booted an Ubuntu 21 Live CD to test Linux support. Out of the box, the touchpad, keyboard, Wi-Fi, Ethernet, and speakers work. The keyboard shortcuts for keyboard brightness, screen brightness, and volume controls also worked fine, but I wasn't able to change performance profiles with the F5 shortcut. Now let's discuss pricing. This will change over time, so check out those links in the description below for updated prices. At the time of recording, the Tough Dash F15 with the same specs I've tested here is $1770 US dollars on Amazon, though there are also cheaper options with RTX 3060 graphics too. I'm actually working on the review of the new Asus Strix G15 Advantage Edition right now, and that laptop is meant to be $1650 US dollars, and for that you get an 8-core Ryzen 9 5900HX processor and Radeon RX 6800M graphics, which are a little behind Nvidia's RTX 3080. Honestly, just between the Strix G15 which costs less money compared to this, I would go for the G15. It just seems like a better deal for me compared to spending more for a quad-core model. Sure, the F15 is smaller and lighter, but at what cost? Personally, I would take a little thickness for extra performance gains, but that's just me. Granted, this does also have some other features like Thunderbolt 4, so at the end of the day, it depends what you're after. This is clearly a thinner and lighter model, but at the same time, Asus also have other options under 2cm thick with much more powerful 8-core parts, though those Zephyrus models do cost more. I suppose this seems like Asus's way of offering a thinner and lighter machine at a lower price point compared to the Zephyrus lineup. But as we've seen, it does come at the expense of performance. If you're just doing lighter tasks, then you might not necessarily need 6 or 8 cores, and a quad core might be perfectly fine. Just don't be surprised to see lower spec options beating it. At least a result of those lower power limits is also lower internal temperatures, though the exterior did still feel a little warm to the touch when under load. But at least the battery life is pretty good. One memory slot isn't ideal for future upgrades, but is likely a trade-off for the thinner chassis, and lack of camera in the days of work from home and Zoom meetings will be enough for some to look elsewhere. Let me know what you thought of the Asus Tough Dash F15 down in the comments. Get subscribed if you're new to the channel for future laptop reviews like this one. Come and join me in Discord and get behind the scenes videos by supporting the channel on Patreon. And if you need something else to do, then come and check out some of my other videos over here. I'll see you over in one of those next.